All right, half a day, everybody, and uh, welcome to the July 20th uh, Guam Green Growth Steering Committee meeting. Uh, this is our first time to convene in person, so this is a good step. Uh, and I uh, wanted to just say how great it is to see everybody in person. Um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, first actually recognize uh, my co-chair, Dr. Austin Shelton, and uh, maybe defer to him first for his update. How about that, Chair? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, as, uh, for co-chair updates on the University of Guam side, we have um, a few things that have been going on over the past uh, month or so. Um, and I have some updates related to our Sustainable Alliances group, actually. Um, so for um, our partnership with the Local 2030 Islands Network, this is our... Um, our network that we've joined with uh, Hawaii Green Growth uh, and uh, the Global Islands Partnership, or GLISPA, as the, um, the, the co-chair secretariat. Uh, we're, partner we're partnering with islands around the world, like Seychelles, Grenada, uh, and uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, FSM, Marshall Islands, uh, and Palau, working on uh, implementing the sustainable development goals in locally and culturally effective ways. Um, and so we are... Um, Currently, have been talking with uh, Palau on helping to set up a local 2030 uh, dashboard, like we have for a Guam Green Growth Dashboard. There's interest in Palau doing something similar uh, and following the model that we've been scaling from Hawaii to Guam and to Palau and uh, moving it onto other islands where we can track our local actions and how we're making global impact on uh, meeting these 17 sustainable development goals. Um, so that, that's um, exciting for us to, to help our fellow islanders um, keep moving in this direction and um, showing that islands are bright spots uh, to achieve a more sustainable future for our whole planet. Uh, another uh, new partnership area uh, that we are working on is with uh, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and uh, the University of San Francisco de Quito in, uh, in Ecuador. Uh, President Christ and I were invited as speakers to the uh, to the Galapagos Islands last month, uh, where we uh, were featured speakers to share about the global growth activities, and so that was very well received um, from the different island partners um, from around the world that was there. And so it was really interesting to see that the Galapagos, just on the other side of the Pacific, um, is sort of a different extreme on how we do sustainability. That there is um, that the the animals the wildlife, uh, the environment really comes first because people only came to the Galapagos uh, less than 200 years ago. And so we have our 3,500 to 4,000 year history in Guam and uh, we have all of these things. So it's a really nice exchange. Um, but more importantly, we found some really uh, uh, new technologies that I think will be very helpful to our movement um, in sustainability here. There are technologies in the circular economy that we've been talking about that we are hoping to test in our G3 circular economy makerspace and innovation hub at the Chamorro Village. Uh, these are things like uh, alternatives to plastic that we can make out of um, items like fish bones and oyster shells and uh, also invasive seaweed, like uh, you may have seen our conservation corps picking out of Molesso, uh, there may be ways to turn these into plastic-like materials um, and have a, a much better environmental footprint on the island. There's also ocean energy uh, connections that we were able to with the University of Edinburgh, who has uh, one of the very few uh, ocean uh, wave generators. And uh, so we are hoping to, to form a partnership where they will do um, more pilots in Galapagos, in French Polynesia, and also in Guam. So we, we hope to get the, um, these things moving um, over the next year, and uh, we expect uh, quite a few of these delegates from the World Summit on Island Sustainability to join us in Guam at our next conference uh, on island sustainability, which will be April 11th through 15th in 2023. Uh, Another thing is that uh, I was just off a call with our Climate Strong Islands Network. This is another uh, network of focus on islands, but U.S. islands. So we are partners with Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, uh, islands off the coast of Maine, and islands uh, in the Great Lakes and off of Alaska. And uh, there is a policy framework that has been developed. Uh, and we have been having meetings to, to share about the needs of islands, uh, specifically that uh, Congress and the Senate can be helping us with. Uh, just a quick example is that there was the, the Insular Islands Climate Act that was um, introduced to Congress 
uh, really in this uh, current term. And there was a big portion about uh, renewable energy um, appliances, I'm sorry, um, energy efficient appliances. And there would have been an unintended consequence if that came to light that uh, we probably have a lot more washers and dryers and refrigerators ending up in our um, in our mills uh, with illegal dumping. But we were able to um, speak with uh, the House Natural Resources Committee, and then they put an additional section in there about uh, having a recycling program also tied to this. So those are just ways for um, Congress to be thinking about the specific means of islands, and this network has been very helpful for that. So with uh, Climate Strong and the Local 2030 Islands Network, uh, there will be uh, more momentum to come up in September when we meet in um, in New York at the, the sidelines of the UN General Assembly and Climate Week um, in New York City. So we're looking forward um, to those events coming up in September. And finally, I hope I'm not stealing this from Benji's group, but um, are you going to talk about the NIFWF grant that Fran submitted recently? No, I didn't give the details. I so, just because I was. Yeah, we were, um, so one of our projects um, is the Guam Restoration of Watersheds or the Grove Project in Inalahan and Talafofo and the Ugam Watershed. Uh, we are, we have a, a new grant um, that we learned from uh, the Office of, of Insular Affairs at the Territorial Infrastructure Meeting a couple months ago um, on a resilience grant. So we have submitted a carbon offset agroforest idea. So the idea is to keep on planting trees, but now we're going to add in hopefully fruit trees and produce bearing trees that will be able to, to eventually um, have carbon offsets for both the, the timber and the food imports that we're offsetting. So exciting for uh, developments in that area for our natural resources uh, that will hopefully come. So those are my updates. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much. Uh, for me, um, you know, school's coming up in August. We have a very successful uh, summer youth internship program that's going on. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is work with the team. And I think sometime uh, next month, um, I'd like to have a, another presentation of the Youth Action Framework uh, to uh, some of the leadership that wasn't present uh, when, we were, when we received it at the uh, Palm Museum. Uh, so um, I, I, I want to be able to do that and I'll coordinate that. And I think that um, one of the, of course, one of the things that um, the youth have been focusing on in particular has to do with um, what they believe, and I agree with them, um, is uh, an issue with uh, a need for more culturally diverse uh, cultural education programs and to address a lot of the um, implicit and explicit bias that's going on, especially in the school system. So I think we have an opportunity to focus in on that. And I know that um, lately Carlotta has been uh, working with a lot of the um, nonprofit organizations um, that are coming in that are um, based um, with populations from the migrant communities and trying to give them pipelines for projects that are already authorized to let them um, develop uh, and construct community centers that we hope to use uh, to also um, give opportunities for the youth from those um, ethnic groups to, you know, get in touch with um, their culture. I think one of the big things we can see is that a connection with um, their identity definitely helps mitigate a lot of the challenges that we see out there. So uh, I'd like to see something in August, maybe it could be September, but something like a reset. Uh, and I just want to say again, thank you for convening them. It is an excellent product and it shows you um, the wisdom that is abound in the youth. The other thing that's exciting is uh, we have reconstituted the hazard mitigation uh, grant committee, uh, the Bureau of Planning is part of that, and we've been focusing in on uh, funding some projects that um, are trying to address some longstanding issues, uh, including with some of the watersheds and um, and doing some projects. So we'll do it. We'll probably be able to give you an update um, next month on what those projects are going to be. But um, I know, but much of them are dealing, in addition to, of course, mitigating for natural disasters. But um, there's active focus on uh, flood uh, flooding areas watersheds, some of the unfunded studies to give us a pathway to resolve some of the longstanding issues. Uh, the other thing is uh, we received a visit um, from the US Department of Interior, um, from, uh, the, um, from some of the folks that are responsible for oversight over Guam. And we've been really telling the story. Um, and I know they've been seeing a lot of the innovation coming from Guam, including those that are covered by this. So I really think there's a pathway for additional resources and 
to kind of uh, educate the decision makers because some good projects were passed over last time. But I think finally with them being able to be on the ground, first time on the ground in two years kind of helps our efforts. Uh, Dr. Shelton and I also uh, met with uh, folks from the Center for American Progress and our good friend, uh, Angelo Villagomez Gomez has moved from the Pew Foundation and has joined this group and folks from uh, folks responsible from uh, for the I guess the environmental stewardship sustainability portfolio were on the ground talking with us there in the northern Mariana Islands and Dr. Shelton and I were talking to them about some of the big issues that we're trying to address. Um, one of the biggest one, of course, is the issue of solid waste in an isolated island when the recycling markets have collapsed and um, our desire to have on island resources to recover the um, things from the waste stream uh, and try and reduce the uh, amount of land that we need. So uh, I think what they're gonna be able to do is perhaps connect us with um, experts and perhaps give us some pathways uh, to uh, try and validate some of the things that are coming. I told them that one of the things that is happening, we see a lot of new uh, technology emerging and we wanna understand whether or not the technologies have been tested you know, checking whether or not these are bona fide folks coming in and making sure that when uh, we make some decisions on investments that we understand as much as possible what's going on, but pretty much whether or not there's some new stuff um, coming down the pipeline that uh, may influence decisions. So those are kind of things that I can see with a partnership with the Center for um, American Progress. The IBTF, the uh, Idaho Beautification Task Force has been focused, of course, monthly on a bunch of big topic issues. Uh, one of them, of course, is stray animals. Um, the um, the uh, United Airlines decision not to allow animals on flights is now affecting um, a program that Guam Department of Agriculture is trying to get uh, moving, which is to um, import uh, some of the marine life that's going to help us restock and uh, advance some of the work we're doing on coral restoration. Um, between that and uh, decisions about um, the, uh, and limitations on transporting pets off island um, has caused a lot of pets to be abandoned by folks from certain communities. Um, there's also obviously a market to um, for homes in the U.S. looking for some of the strays here. So um, it's a it's an issue that we're going to try and raise up the corporate ladder, and really it's just trying to get us to Hawaii where there is a bit more, it's the really the Hawaii Guam route um, that we're able to, we need to try and address because there's other avenues out in Hawaii to be able to move. Um, of course, there's some a lot of work on um, recovering recreational areas uh, and parks that's going on. The Guam Department of Agriculture has a forestry plan that uh, has been submitted. It's going through the AAA process and we talked about this, I think uh, might be a few meetings ago, but uh, Bureau of Planning uh, and Guam Department of Agriculture led uh, pretty much a pretty good working meeting with all the land um, and resource agencies, going back, taking a look at statutory uh, mandates that already have reserved properties for conservation areas or reforestation. Uh, and so in the big picture, uh, they've come up with um, a complete inventory of that uh, and this attempt is to uh, take advances in the, their uh, mandate for um, reforestation or maintaining forestry, uh, but incorporating some of the concepts that Dr. Shelton talked about with agroforestry and then also influencing whether or not we'll be able to um, take advantage of some of the additional resources that are out there um, that can um, uh, address restoration areas. Uh, other update, um, the governor and I have been working with the military about uh, their land use needs. And because the geopolitics is changing so much, uh, there's so many more, there's so much more interest even within the Department of Defense and now competition within the Department of Defense for uh, properties. So what they're going to be doing is they're conducting a land use plan for themselves. And our expectation and our uh, ask is that uh, number one, uh, they publish it to the people of Guam so that the government of Guam and the private landowners are able to understand early on if there's going to be some uh, environmental concerns 
coming through the pipeline, uh, but also uh, for uh, private property owners and the government to make decisions about um, their land use. So for example, it looks like, um, you know, there's going to be expanded uh, need um, and opportunities for ship repair. It may be within the Guam Economic Development Authority and Port Authority's land that we may decide to um, identify um, land that would be for private sector, public sector use to support such things. So th that's kind of the, the model. Um, they've done this before in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and, um, and it really is what DOD will do. Our expectation is, is that they will use this to sort within themselves um, what exactly they have intended and what is possible. Uh, and to try and keep it to that. And we'll see that be a, that's that's one thing that for us, it's about transparency and trying to get as much information early. Housing has surfaced as a big issue and that um, a meeting with we had with the military, uh, they have agreed to surface housing as a focus area for joint um, work. Uh, uh, we're trying to get uh, us to have a model that I've seen that the city of Anchorage has used which allows the city of Anchorage to forecast with the military all of the inbound and outbound um, military uh, service members and families and uh, use that to try and understand um, what the housing impact is going to be. Uh, for example, there are nearly 400 military housing units that are in repair right now. And once they get repaired, then obviously there are 400 houses out there or apartments being utilized by military folks that should be in there. So it's an attempt to try and in real time as much as possible understand how we can guide what we're doing. And the goal for us, of course, is addressing affordability for the local population, which is one of the big things that we're working on. Uh, right now, the governor is, uh, I think she has been uh, at, um, Lote Hotel, um, speaking and receiving a briefing with um, Guam Power Authority, and um, they're officially um, uh, opening, although they're already operating the um, solar farm up north. Uh, and I had an opportunity last week uh, when Guam Power Authority and the military signed their 10 year contract to go into the control room. And um, what I was pleased about is the technology is advanced enough that uh, they can account for all of the energy being produced at all of their uh, solar uh, areas and what that offsets going, what that, how that's offsetting, um, you know, the burning of the fossil fuel that we're relying on. But I think that um, there's a lot more that we can learn about this. And uh, Dr. Sheldon and I have been talking in the past with Interior and U.S. Energy about doing a convening so that the public understands and we have uh, and we can understand what where GPA is going. We we have some information about um, uh, how they want to proceed with renewables, but I think that, you know, there's always uh, um, an opportunity for us to try and figure out how we can contribute, right? Because I think the perception is that that is really held tight. Um, by the um, by that by the authority, those are things to work for. Uh, we still are. I have to say, um, there is a, a pending issue that uh, we're dealing with. Public Works is concerned. Uh, this is a, a, a continuing concern about the transportation of the largest components of the power plant through Guam's roads. Um, and there's a lot of engineering that needs to occur, and a lot of serious concerns that. Uh, we're looking to understand more. So I would just tell you that Public Works is, um, is um, really focused on that because these components are very heavy. Um, you know, the, our roads, uh, it's a significant logistical issue. Um, and so I think details forthcoming on, um, on what the engineering solutions are going to be. But uh, in the end, it's going to be Public Works that's going to be um, uh, they have the authority to determine um, whether or not these plans are going to meet their mandate by federal highways to for the weights, things like that. So just this is uh, this, this is for everybody's knowledge that that's a big thing. And last thing, uh, the TFAP program, which is a temporary food assistance program, which has been at the Guam Department of Education, gosh, for about 25 years or so, um, is moving uh, to the Guam Department of Agriculture. Uh, we're going through a transition. It's a little rough uh, 
just, you know, like everything is in transition. But um, the objective for the TFAP moving to Guam agriculture is to open uh, the opportunity for locally produced uh, agriculture to be part of the buy from the TFAP program. And that's kind of like an effort that we're making to uh, establish a, a reliable um, uh and predictable market for um, the farmers. And as you know, we've been uh, doing a lot of work providing the Guam farmers, uh, the Guam uh, farmers co-op and and um, and Gita, who now have embraced agriculture and aquaculture as a core economic um, focus area for them, uh, trying to establish those pipelines. So I think the TFAPs first. We know that. Um, uh, Gita was able to open the pipeline at Ukudu High School uh, for local produce to go in, but the big um, target would be uh, trying to figure out a path and a strategy to get the schools to uh, buy more local. And of course, there's contract issues, there's all sorts of things, but um, I'll just say this, when um, years ago, um, Guam farmers had relied upon DOE as a reliable purchaser. Uh, and during the course of time, as they outsourced and stuff and the cost of um, foods by big business became lower, um, you know, they shifted to importing a lot of things. And we're looking for, uh, through local policy and practice, trying to figure out how we can even the playing field so the local produce can get into the school. So I think I would say that that's the big, big issue. Um, that's the focus. And, I, and we're hoping that the TFAP program is going to help us move in that direction. So that's it for me. I'm sorry it took a lot of time. You know go to our coordinator. Cameron. Thank you. Thank you both for your updates. In terms of my updates, I just wanted to thank everybody who sent me um, their current information for their sections in the framework. Uh, there are a few groups. Uh, I, I want to say there are a few groups that um, have not given me their updates. So I will be following up with you um, after this meeting uh, just to make sure that we stay on top of that. Uh, we will. We are preparing for our biannual meeting in September, so um, I just want to keep us all on track um, to uh, have that done in a timely manner. I, um, in addition, I know that uh, our our agencies um, have uh, summer interns through the DYA Youth Program, and um, I think it's a very valuable uh, opportunity for them. I wanted to uh, invite the steering committee members to um, possibly nominate some youth uh, who they would be interested in participating in the youth ambassador program. Um, that would be, a, I, I would like to um, just maintain this connection that we have with our youth and um, just uh, possibly develop, um, you know, our, our connections with them uh, more. So if, if um, any of your members in, in your working group have um, any nominations for youth who would be um, ideal for uh, the youth ambassadors uh, working group, please let me know. Um, that's all for my updates. Okay, so now we will move on to the working group, um, the steering, the working group um, co-chairs. Um, if we can get uh, the updates from, if we can get the updates from um, Ms. Lola Leon Guerrero from Healthy and Prosperous Communities. Okay, hi, good morning, happy everybody. Um, so the updates for the Healthy and Prosperous Communities, uh, basically we've been, the members have been working to update the framework. Uh, we had a meeting last month. And so what we did was we just uh, created a shared file so that everybody can provide their updates in that shared file. And that appears to be working well. And then those who have not really contributed, uh, we're sending WhatsApp messages so that they can provide the information. So under the Zero Hunger, um, UOG Cooperative Extension and Outreach continues to work on preparing for the 2023 Census of Agriculture. Um, they also continue to develop a food system asset map in uh, partnership with Department of Agriculture. Uh, with regards to establishing the food system permitting, um, Department of Agriculture continues to work with Department of Revenue, Tax, and EPA to streamline those processes. And that's, that's ongoing. 
Uh, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned the Guam Forest System Plan um, that has been drafted and released, and it's for review and approval, and plots of lands have been identified. With regards to um, under the good health and well being, um, with this, Department of Agriculture hired a vet, a vet as the territory veterinarian, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, for the humatic baseball field lights, um, the project is completed, and um, I guess they're just having some issues with installation and testing, and this is supposed to take place um, the end of this month. And then hopefully once all of that is addressed, they'll be able to have, um, I guess, groundbreaking for that project. Um, to increase the pool of certification substance abuse treatment specialists, uh, the, GCC, the GCC cohort that started in December uh, will complete the program in September 30, 2022. The Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center and continues to apply for federal funding to expand their substance abuse treatment program. Uh, Guam Behavioral Center has partnered with Gura to prepare the bid specs to renovate the Talafofo Cottage Home. Uh, and DPW anticipates to release the bid for this uh, by the end of this month. In regards to the construction of the sober living homes over in Tiza, where the Lighthouse Center is at, um, there's, there's still, I guess, some issues with manpower. So Inland Builder, the contractor has um, advertised with GDOE for workers. And so they're basically waiting for the rival more H2B workers uh, in September, 2022. Um, a nonprofit organization, AMTI, was formed by a group of private citizens. Uh, AMTI would be pursuing funding for future women's clinic offering women's health services to include a full range of reproductive health services. Um, then under the decent work and economic growth, uh, the Sinahanya Community Arts Center is at 95% complete. And uh, I was informed by Mr. Rivera that they will be coordinating a ribbon cutting ceremony with the governor's office and May May Mayor Hoffman shortly. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can I ask uh, Dr. Mary Okada from the Educated, Capable, and Compassionate Island to provide her update? Sure. Um, so a couple of um, updates I have are uh, boot camps are con continuing and um, completion ceremonies. We completed childcare and bus driving. And so those uh, folks are um, in, um, in employment. Uh, the project, U summer camp completed with 30 plus participate, uh, participants, and that segued into the governor's summer youth employment program. And just provide more uh, details on the summer youth intern and employment program. It's in its fifth week of the six week program. There are 1,303 youth participants at over 80 host entities. Um, and it's approximately $700,000 per pay period. And this is funded through the governor's uh, education stabilization fund and so the project will complete uh, July 29 2022 in addition DY aid acquired and has implemented its first automated case management system so they're now better able to use the data to inform policy and practice um, on the GDOE side GDOE adopted the board has adopted the uh, GDOE strategic plan so that is in place and the GDOE facilities master plan has been completed and is still pending uh, board approval. Um, Guam Department of Labor had a very successful job fair and that was uh, highly publicized. And um, a lot of, um, I think they had over 2000 uh, applicants and probably about a thousand jobs that were available. Wow. Uh, GDOL also has a new MOU with Manyetlu Organization and Micronesian Resource Center that helps to bridge training and employment for the Micronesian community. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Okada. May I now call on Ms. Ben, um, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Respicio is not here today to uh, represent the Sustainable Home Utilities and Transportation Working Group. So I will uh, provide her update. Um, in terms of the updates uh, for the Sustainable Hut Working Group, the GRTA grant application is submitted for a $9.5 million ride-along park. 
uh, the Energy Expo uh, will be held Saturday, uh, July 23rd from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Micronesian Mall. Uh, we are all invited to join giveaways and a lot of resources from various vendors and agencies um, on clean energy and sustainable living will be present. And our um, the Sustainable Hut Group will meet in a per person in early August. Um, now may I ask Ms. Fanji Luhan from the Thriving Natural Resources Group to provide your update? Thank you so much. Um, as, as Dr. Shelton said, uh, Sea Grant has put in a NIFWF uh, um, application to do some work in upland restorations related to the GROW project. But I also would like to say that uh, so Department of Agriculture has also, uh, the summer tends to be the time where a lot of agencies start working on their grants and submitting grants. That Department of Agriculture has also done that with like the America the Beautiful grants. And so they're looking forward to doing a lot of different types of restoration work. We are, in our group, we're talking about in addition to agroforest, which is really combined using as part of the toolkit of restoration, other than native plants, um, as Dr. Shelton said, fruit plants. But we're now also trying to look at the viability of um, cleaning up the wetlands and making it productive for food as well. Because uh, as we talk about climate change, food security is a big issue. So uh, that's going to be something that we're um, going to be investigating the ability to, to do restoration in wetlands as a, another source of food and as well as restoration of the wetland for um, the plants and animals that live there. But I also would like to report that we were very fortunate um, that the uh, University of Gu the the cohort the conservation corps visited the Ugam water our Ugam water treatment plant so the work that they're doing under the grow program with sea grant is all the upland restoration and so hopefully we show them the real connection between upland restoration and the practical part of develop of utilizing water resources for Ugam and that watershed that provides water to um, the rest of the the people in the south. So it's uh, the work that we're doing is not just for improvement of the ecosystem, but there's also from the utility side, the ability for us to reduce turbidity and produce water. And, and I hope that um, we're really great at, from my GWA hat, very grateful that this project is happening in the upland restorations because we're a direct benefactor of that. The Department of Agriculture is also in the third phase of their habitat conservation plan. This is the plan that I, um, really looks at the impact of um, development to in, um, endangered species. They will be out sometime in this, the end of this next quarter to do additional stakeholder meetings as well as prepare the plan. Um, one of the things that uh, forestry is doing right now is they are getting some additional funding uh, to support um, the rare tree restoration within the watershed. And so they are getting some funding from US Fish and Wildlife Section 6 for injured species. The other thing is that um, the watershed uh, discussions are going to be happening also at the next planning symposium. And I know that Dr. Shelton and I will be on that panel to discuss the importance of watersheds. NOAA is out here and they'll be out in August doing a update to the Manel Gaius watershed plan. And so they'll be doing field surveys as well as engaging with the stakeholders. I know that, that the Manel Gaius watershed is a big watershed other than Ugum that a lot of work is concentrated on. And so I think they're gonna do a, a watershed plan that meets all the criteria of US EPA. It's rainy season and that's the best time for planting and forestry is going to be sending out a schedule and I hope the community will support all their efforts in planting trees. They have been very engaged forestry with pruning all the trees along Marine Drive so that make sure that um, the, when we have the parade that the trees are protected as well as the people are protected. Um, if you haven't seen a couple of weeks ago there was some uh, coverage of the 3D mapping for coral reefs that were with the, with Dr. Romina King. They map Aching MPA and Cocos Island. And it's all part of uh, supporting the National Climate Change Assessment Section 5. So um, right now in our Climate Change Commission, we will have an, a meeting in August. We have been um, talking in the previous 
meetings about looking at developing a policy for development. Uh, recently, the Army Corps of Engineers submitted a islands a document about developing um, development criteria for buildings for tropical environments, and it doesn't include a section on how do we build related to climate change. Uh, the last thing is that in our thriving natural resources, there's a section about the aquifer and the protection of the aquifer, ensuring that there's contaminants and the ability for recharge. And so uh, I also lead a uh, aquifer meeting that occurs every quarter. Our next meeting for the aquifer group will be in July 28th. And this will talk about the impacts of septic tanks to the aquifer. And so if anybody is interested, there will be, we'll do it as a hybrid um, virtually as well as at the Gloria Nelson building in Manila at nine o'clock. Please let me know if you're interested. And that's about it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Luhan. Now may I call on Ms. Trina Leber from the Sustainable Alliances Working Group to provide your update. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of updates. One is the um, Fanta Manhoban, uh, the a conference on um, the, it's called the Youth Decolonization Conference and the Commission on Decolonization, the Youth for Decolonization, the public high schools, the University of Guam and Guam Community College are all um, coming together to host the two two-day conference. It will be held at the Guam Museum on um, the 28th and 29th of September. Uh, and then there will be a, a follow-on day on Friday the 30th for organ the organizers. Um, the idea behind this is to build the capacity of um, local students at both the high school and college level and um, the, uh, immerse them in how decolonization connects to their everyday lives and the role they play in advancing it. And um, the hope is to create a meaningful long-term student-led action to support the movement for self-determination and decolonization. So the commission uh, will convene 15 student liaisons from Guam's public, private, and charter high schools, as well as UOG and GCC, to curate a comprehensive and enriching program for the students. Um, the current status and RFQ was sent out for a logistics coordinator to assist um, with the uh, development of the program and the um, development of the event and promotion of it, and uh, also to help with uh, logistics, student stipends, honorariums, etc. The RFQ deadline is July 25th, um, and then. Uh, some additional needs for the conference are funding to fly in and host guest artists and speakers, potentially people like Meta Sarmiento or Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, um, but these would be decided by the youth liaisons. Um, and uh, they're also looking for uh, facilitation help. So uh, in addition, I have a quick update from the uh, some summarized results from the UN Ocean Conference that took place in Lisbon, Portugal from June 27th to July 1st. It was attended by um, uh, roughly 5,000 participants and had 24 heads of state. Um, it was uh, some of the key things that I think are relevant to Guam. Um, the UK joined a high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy and announced that um, roughly 150 million of the 500 million uh, pound Blue Planet Fund will be directed towards a new global program to protect and restore valuable coastal and marine habitats such as corals, mangroves, and seagrasses, uh, improve the sustainability and productivity of small-scale fisheries, and help developing countries unlock aquaculture's potential. Uh, Canada, the UK, and the US launched a new IUU Fishing Action Alliance. Um, IUU is in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The US and Norway announced a green shipping challenge for the upcoming UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the, the 27th Conference of the Parties. Um, a call from the group of the, uh, the group of 77 in China for an, their, they called for an institutional framework such as the UNFCCC, the UN Framework on um, Climate Change for specifically for the ocean. 
Uh, there were calls from several delegations, including Palau, Fiji, and Samoa, for a moratorium on deep sea on deep seabed mining. Uh, but notably, the um, this did not include completely out to the EEZs. So um, it, to be determined what that will look like. And then finally, the protecting our ocean, the protecting our planet challenge announced that it will invest at least um, one billion U.S. dollars to support the creation, expansion, and management of marine protected areas and indigenous and locally governed marine and coastal areas by 2030. So, um, and one final thing, just to follow on uh, and um, amplify what Dr. Shelton said. Um, the next Micronesia Challenge Regional Support Team call in August will have feature a deep dive on the dashboards that um, Austin uh, shared about from the Islands 2030 network. So we usually attract roughly 30 to 40 people on those calls. And so um, anybody who's interested from this group, I'm happy to pass on the invitation. It will probably be the third week of August. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Labrador. May I call on Mr. Kyle Mantepat to report? Senator uh, Carlotta first. Oh. As part of that group. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Senator Carlotta, do you have any um, uh, additional updates? What I would add a little bit to what Banji said is um, I participated as a member of uh, uh, this group on the uh, National Climate Assessment 5, the infrastructure group with Dr. Romina King. And what I was advancing is something different than what uh, Mel Borja and is advancing. And I'm advancing um, pushing DOD to have a greater humanitarian role, um, especially with climate change. So um, I'm saying that um, we are affected by the high tides and climate migration. When they don't have food security and water security, then they start to migrate here. So um, that's a kind of a novel approach to to say to DOD, when you're out there doing training and testing and going around the islands, check in with them ahead of time and bring them, you know, salt water resistant taro or water catchment and, you know, check in on them. Uh, yeah. So that's one of the things I've been advancing. And that's what I brought into NCA5. And I got accepted as a technical writer. So I felt that I, I got it in. This is a new way of thinking into this national uh, assessment. So. Uh, I bring that as a member of the Sustainable Alliance and also to give everybody an update. There was a recent meeting of the Pacific Island Forum. Australia and the United States came back big and uh, they're reassuring uh, the Pacific that they are interested and turned a new leaf and um, the U.S. is committed to opening embassies in Kiribati, Solomons, and Tonga. This is so huge. So as we're, the governor has wanted us to show greater leadership into the Pacific. This really helps us when, you know, uh, America sets up the, these kind of embassies and stuff. And also, I would want to say with Lola, Lola and Cheerful and I worked with all of the G3 committees to document everything, to go into the Pacific Ocean Alliance report that went to Lisbon. So PIF created this report on the um, 2050 Blue Continent Pacific strategy. And all of the work of our G3 kind of got coordinated through BSP and through Cheerful in my office a bit. So we were there in Lisbon, buried in that report, but we're coming up through PIF. So that's all I have to add. Okay. to what everybody else has done. Okay, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, now, <laughs> Mr. Kyle Mandipat from the Data and Public Engagement Working Group. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a great upsurge with G3 uh, as of late, uh, with more people and organizations getting more comfortable with in-person activities. Our uh, outreach team has conducted a lot of great uh, work uh, through the last month. They've held the outreach to the Japanese school with Gala, uh, Lil Sprouts, and with the Taking Roots uh, summer camp, along with the schools and the summer school program. Uh, they've been down at Jose Rios and so much more. So shout out to our G3 outreach team, of course, Mr. Phil uh, Cruz and Ms. Anania Nata Kemp, along with Ms. Tori Manley. Uh, if you or anybody out there listening or 
for watching now has any opportunities for outreach, be it in your schools or community groups. We're always open and available to help get the word out about the SDGs and some of the programs and implementation projects that we've got going uh, here on the island. So feel free to reach out and we'll schedule something with you. Uh, the Guam Restoration of Watersheds or GROW is also holding a three-part uh, outplanting event, which fits into our outreach schedule. Uh, this will be happening in support of G3, of course, and the SDGs 13, climate change, uh, 14, life below water, and 15, life on land. Uh, there's going to be three outplanting events scheduled thus far. Uh, the first one will be on Saturday, July 30th. Second one will be September 3rd, which is also a Saturday. And then October 1st uh, will be the final one. And all of them are looking to start at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, with the exception of, I believe, the first. We're going to amend that schedule a little bit because it's also the day uh, that we'll be having Arbor Fest at Jeff's Pirates Cove to include and to uh, welcome all of our partners uh, with the tree planting and with all of our uh, our efforts along with the, the community to come on out and learn how they can uh, contribute there as well. So those are some big outreach events that we've got planned uh, through the upcoming months. Uh, we also recently uh, released the UOG CIS newsletter, which features, of course, Guam Green Growth updates. I encourage everybody to please log on and sign up for that if you haven't already. I believe all of our working group members are a part of this. Uh, but if you are watching online or if the emails aren't making it to your inbox, let me know and I'll take care of it for you. And then, of course, our website is always updated with some of the projects we've got going as well. And finally, uh, we're gearing up for the Guam Green Growth Conservation Corps graduation ceremony. It's going to wrap up its second season. We're going to hear a little bit more uh, from the team in just a bit. Uh, it's going to take place the day after our next steering committee meeting, and it's going to happen here at Adam, uh, August 18th. And last year's ceremony was held virtually due to COVID restrictions. Uh, this year, it's going to be in person. So we really hope that everybody can make it down and uh, help us celebrate another milestone with this great group. Thank you. I just wanted to make a correction. It, um, our next steering committee meeting and the GC, GCC um, graduation will be August 17th. Oh, 17th. Yes, Wednesday, August 17th. Same day, correct? Yep. Yes. Okay, so we'll do the graduation down, down there the lawn, and then we'll come up. up for the steering committee meeting right after. Oh, nice. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, now we'll move on to our presentation by uh, Mr. Phil Cruz and our two G3CC members. I'll have you folks introduce yourselves. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you guys for having us today. Again, I'm Phil Cruz. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator at UOG Center for Island Sustainability at CBAT, and I work with the um, with uh, Guang Green Growth as um, a co-coordinator of the Conservation Corps program, along with Hannah and Dr. Kemp. And um, this program, as most of you know, is a it's five month workforce development program that aims at um, getting the, the getting the um, local community ready um, through through our through our members uh, for the green economy. So we have uh, um, so with our with our ten members, we have uh, different activities in agriculture and aquaculture, circular economy and zero waste, energy conservation and renewable energy, ocean conservation, invasive species management and watershed restoration and reforestation. I'll go ahead and next, next slide. And um, so with, the, with this conservation core, of course, we are um, addressing the UN SDGs. So with all of the activities, we do um, highlight to the members and to the community when we do our outreach, what uh, sustainable development goals we are focusing on. And uh, just some of the uh, work that's, um, so I'm not sure. So I will be providing like a summary of everything or, because I understand that um, each, each meeting we have, right? There's updates on what the Conservation Corps has already done. Uh, do I need to? Um, if you have like in total numbers of, of the overall impact accomplishments yes. so far. Yes, we do. Um, okay, we can we go to the next. So we do have our, um, island beautification events that we have um, every Friday at the different villages. So far, we have reached uh, 17 of our 19 villages with 288 um, bag, large bags of trash, 57 uh, bags of minimum cans that, that will be recycled uh, with the iRecycle program, which will help raise funds for our local schools. It's a lot. We have uh, three uh, containers. Um, these are the uh, roll off, the 20 cubic yard roll off containers of household items, metals, and trash, um, six trailers of uh, just strictly metals. And then 263 uh, um, individual items of whether white goods or other like items, including furniture or uh, just gosh, like any large, any really large item that wouldn't just go in a regular trash bag. So these different, um, when you go to the different villages, it, it really is up to the mayor to just uh, let us know what type of beautification we will be 
providing. So uh, some of them were roadside cleanups where, so there weren't so many of those large, large bulky items, but some of them were illegal dump sites that have been identified in the different villages. And the mayors have been sh uh, sharing that these illegal dump sites have been uh, really growing. Um, so there really is a, a, a very large concern um, for this. And they are sharing that, you know, they're, they're speculating that it's, a lot of it is due to, um, and, um, you know, uh, families who have, who are, uh, have a lower socioeconomic status, they have uh, lower incomes and cannot afford to uh, dispose of their waste properly. So this is something that uh, with this data, we hope that this can help um, inform policy and um, help our, our decision makers to uh, figure, figure out solutions to solve these, these issues. Um, and then with, within the individual activities, just um, highlighting some of the, uh, the work that they've done with, for example, agriculture and aquaculture, they've worked with um, Guam Sustainable Culture, uh, the UG Triton Farms, Valley Velati, um, Circular Economy and Zero Waste. The Conservation Corps has worked um, with uh, Guam Waste Control, uh, Mr. Rubbishman, Guam, uh, Guam Solid Waste Authority. So they've learned the, the uh, operations of waste in Guam. So from, from when people dispose of it uh, properly, um, you know, the channels that it goes through all the way up until the landfill or being shipped off island for recycling. Um, They've, uh, tour, they visited uh, the, the lads in landfill, for example, the order dump that has closed with uh, energy conservation and renewable energy. They've worked with uh, Pacific Solar and Photovoltaics, learning about the solar industry in Guam and uh, careers in uh, growing careers in the, in the solar field in, with renewable energy. Uh, with ocean conservation, we've worked, the Corps has worked um, with uh, Master Navigator Larry Regatol uh, with traditional navigation. Um, they've uh, done. Uh, they've completed uh, algae removal at the Tupungan Channel, like um, Dr. Shelton mentioned earlier. Uh, to uh, remove this invasive algae that is uh, impacting our corals, and then uh, hopefully in the future, this this type of algae could be used uh, for circular economy. And then with our circular economy uh, and zero waste efforts, um, they worked, of course, with the G3 Makerspace and Innovation Hub, um, learning how to use some of the machines, uh, learning how to convert this waste material into new, new products. Uh, of course, uh, and with iRecycle. So uh, we worked very closely with Ms. Peggy Denny from iRecycle, learning about uh, the program and a uh, proper sorting. With invasive species management, we worked with the um, Agriculture Biosecurity Division, learning about the coconut rhinoceros beetle and the fire ant, how to, how to um, help eradicate those species. Um, we worked with uh, National Park Service with um, brown tree snake uh, hunting and removal. So learning how to find, uh, identify them uh, in the jungles or you know at your home and how to um, humanely um, what's the word um, euthanize. Thank you. Humanize <laughs> them. Um, and oh, they visited the wildlife refuge, learning about uh, the work that's being done uh, up at the wildlife refuge. How many snakes did you catch? Like more than 20. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the site that they've gone, they've, uh, they're up at the refuge for the training. They've uh, gone to Aspen Beach Park and to Lover's Point. So, and this was uh, all at night because the brown tree snakes are nocturnal species. So it's, all these activities happen at night. And then with watershed restoration and reforestation, of course, they work with the UGC Grants uh, Grow Team, the Guam Restoration of Watersheds. And uh, at the Ugo watershed, where Ms. Sanji mentioned, they also learned, they went down to the Ugo water treatment plant, learning about um, utilities in Guam and how it's important that we protect our, our land. And, and it's important that we make good decisions um, on land in order for us to protect our, our, our resources. And of course, they've gone through professional development training, uh, job hazard analysis training, safety training, first aid and CPR. And before the end of the program, they'll be um, undergoing resume writing, preparing for an interview just to get them really ready for the workforce. And, oh, um, the next slide we have, we would like to share um, what a project that's coming up. Oh, maybe after. So we'll go ahead and let um, our two Conservation Corps members, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's okay, I'll, I'll go after them. So I'll let our two Conservation Corps members just share their experiences so far and uh, maybe some of their uh, most memorable experiences and how that's impacted you. Good morning, everybody. Happy day. My name is Dulce Embo, and I am one of the supervisors for the uh, Conservation Corps second season. <laughs> and uh, for me, what you know, we have all done a lot of things. So it's been such a steep learning curve and really just immense experiences that we've had. 
And one of the things that really stood out to me, as Ms. Banji said, is really doing the watershed restoration and reforestation. Because when we were starting out, it seems it's such a, you know, there's this badlands and we sometimes call it like being on Mars because there's just so many, so much red dirt and really talking about uh, erosion control and trying to do what we can um, in the forest and, you know, planting the acacia trees. But we didn't really see like, okay, so what, what is this going to do for everybody else? But when we went down to the Ugum Water Treatment Plant with GWA, as well as the Valley of the Laddie Farm, um, we see how, you know, it really emphasizes community action and that the sustainability challenges that we have really needs to be coming uh, from collaborative partnerships. So for us, it's taking that individual action and really Im um, embedding it in community. So now when I go to the Ugum Watershed and I'm pruning like the hundredth tree or, you know, like trying to get some wind or some breeze there um, or, you know, fertilize trees or, you know, with the bush cutters, cutting grass for fire break maintenance and forest and um, site preparation, things like that. I see that that, you know, that benefits a lot of people. It benefits the Uba River, um, you know, mm -hmm. with trying to make sure that that, uh, that water can get to like 20% of the people in the South. So that's like 80,000 households. I'm like, I'm pruning this tree so that 80,000 people in the South <laughs> can have clean water, nice. you know? Nice. And not only that, that the Valley of the Ladi can continue their work. So it's not only just um, public partnerships, but there's also private landowners that are in there. So it really benefits the entire community. And that starts with what I do you know, at Ugum Watershed with the GROW team and the rest of the Conservation Corps. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please be thinking of green jobs for you. They're graduating in August. They'll be in the building. <laughs> uh, half a day and good morning, everyone. My name is Johnny Borja. I am also uh, the other supervisor in this year's uh, Guam Green Growth uh, conservation Corps. Uh, for me, this last four months, honestly, has been a very, very um, adventurous and learning experience. Um, you know, growing up on this island of Guam, you really think that um, there's not much to it, right? It's very small. Uh, you could travel around it an hour, right? But uh, after going through every village and meeting with a lot of the people and seeing uh them over and over again constantly you know you really do see how small guam is and how much uh, our everyday activities really impact our island right uh from our island beautification every village has a trash problem every village uh -huh. um even in our southern villages in alahan uh, talafufu it may not be as uh, present in like the roads or on the streets, but the microplastics in the ocean, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I get very emotional when I talk about our beautiful island because it is such a beautiful, peaceful place that we all call home, right? And uh, one thing that I really wanna push forward is to just let everyone know that we are one, you know? It's all our problem. Uh, we have many problems, and I know sometimes it's overwhelming, uh, especially, you know, working with so many agencies or like, oh, what's their problem? What's their problem? What's their problem? You know, how can we do our part? How can we help? And I just feel like if we push that education, you know, along for our G3, educating the youth, um, the future can only get better for our island. And, you know, I look forward to being able to share my experiences after this uh, season ends and being able to really help educate uh, for, for future purposes, right? But it's been a great experience so far. Can't wait for, to finish up. We've got one more month and uh, take all our experiences on the future. Thanks. Thank you. Of the Conservation Corps, really, we wouldn't have been able to have such a successful program without you guys really, you know, uh, taking the lead, the leadership roles and uh, guiding the rest of the team to completing the tasks and, um, you know, working closely with our with the mentors at, in each week. 
So thank you very much for that. So also one thing we wanted to highlight is um, a very exciting project that we have that we've been working on the last several weeks. So um, as you all know, tomorrow is liberation is our Liberation Day Parade. And um, so this was our, our first time coming back to after two years of uh, virtual virtual events. And so uh, what we'll be doing um, with the Conservation Corps in partnership with um, Iris Cycle and DP, DPW, and also with Island Beautification Task Force is to um, issue out uh, 200 recycling uh, recycling bins to the spectators along the prairie route. So um, we've uh, purchased um, several, several rolls of um, poultry netting, so the chicken wire and the Conservation Corps, actually the rest of the team is actually at UOG right now, um, still assembling uh, the rest of the, the 200 that we're making. And so um, turning this chicken wire into into bins for aluminum beverage cans. And as you can see on the screen, we do have a, um, uh, our graphics team put together a really nice, um, oh yes, thank you very much. We have a sign uh, to let the people know it's for aluminum beverage cans only. Uh, currently the recycling um, market is really, really tough. It's very challenging. And so uh, we're focusing just on aluminum cans this time. This is what's the most, um, is the, uh, the most profitable for our schools via the iRecycle program. Um, and of course, current, currently we um, cannot recycle plastics on a on a large scale, so we will not be collecting that. So we will be issuing um, with the core. We'll be issuing out the 200 bins, educating the spectators on proper recycling, and also uh, at the end of the parade, after we collect all the cans, the um, families can take home these bins and, and use that to continue uh, practicing recycling at home at their parties on a daily basis. Um, and we'll also be providing. Um, them with the locations of where they could drop off their cans. So at any of the, I believe, 40 plus schools on island with the iRecycle bin, as well as the 19 villages who have the, the Guam Green Growth Recycling bin, whether it's at the mayor's office or at the community center. So we will be um, putting that on our social media and the website on that of the island and where to take them so that um, the spectators can continue recycling at home and they have a, a convenient place to drop off their cans. So we're excited for that. And uh, that's all the updates I have. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, good. Nice. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, we we're so happy that you guys invited us to share um, the work that we're doing and um, you know the work that we're going to continue to do. So, this is my.